Well, good morning, church. Uh, welcome, welcome. If this is your first time, like Pastor Chris said, we especially want to welcome you and uh, trust that uh, you, uh, what God has for you this morning is incredibly important for you. Uh, for the rest of you, glad that you are here. And, um, and I, for those of you who don't know me, by the way, my name is Ronnie. Um, I am on staff here, and I have the great honor and privilege of being able to share from God's word this morning. Um, as we get started, I have a question for you. Um, have you ever played that game, Who Am I? It's like this game where you try to figure out who the other person is pretending to be or who the other person is thinking about. Um, well, my kids have this board game called Guess Who, and it's kind of like that. So they have these, these boards that have all these different characters, like 30 or 40 characters on them, and, um, and they're all in random places. And then each of them draws a card um, of one of those, those characters. And then their job is to ask questions to narrow down who that person is, who that other person's character is. So, for example, one of my kids might say, uh, does your character have brown hair? And if the answer is yes, then all the characters that don't have brown hair are eliminated, and then it's the next person's turn. And it keeps going until somebody successfully guesses who that character is. Um, so just for kicks and giggles this morning, just for fun, um, let's actually do a little bit of that this morning, okay? So I am thinking of somebody, okay? And I'm going to give you a few clues and see if you can guess who this is, okay? Um, so uh, clue number one. This person goes to Crosswinds Church. Okay, that narrowed the, like, the whole world down to like 500 people, okay? Uh, I know, I know, that was enough. Um, let me see. Um, this person is on staff at Crosswinds Church. Okay, now I've narrowed it down to five people, okay? Um, let's see, what else? Um, oh, this person is married. Oh, wait, that doesn't help because all of us are married. Um, okay, here you go, here you go. Okay, um, I uh, have four kids I love Carolina basketball, and sometimes when I preach, I run the risk of falling off the stage. <laughs> love you, Pastor Chris. <laughs> yeah, you guys got it? Yeah, that's who am I? Who am I? So, sorry, love you, brother. I did get his permission to use that, okay? So just so you know, just so you know. Who am I? It's a simple question, linguistically speaking but it is often one of the most challenging questions humankind ever faces. And I would venture to say that every single one of us, at some point or another, or maybe multiple times through our lives, have asked that question, who am I? And at times, we answer that question by describing ourselves. Like, I am five foot six, love the color purple, I have a husband, six kids, and a dog named Tux. I also like Pepsi, tacos, and strawberry banana milkshakes. And in my free time, I like to read, do puzzles, or chill out in my hammock. That describes me, Ronnie Bundy. Or sometimes uh, we, we answer that question by describing what we do or the activities we participate in. Like, I work at Crosswinds Church to help adults take their next step in following Jesus. I also help to oversee both of our youth groups. Um, in addition to having six kids, I also homeschool those kids. And uh, in the spring particularly, I like to work in our yard. That is what I do. But describing our physical characteristics or describing what we do only scratches the surface of the question, who am I? It doesn't get down deep to the core of who we really are. It doesn't answer those questions that keep us awake at night or plague us throughout the day. Am I good enough? Am I talented enough? Do I matter? What are people thinking about me? Have I made a difference in the world? And then would anybody notice if I wasn't even here? And at times, those questions become even more difficult to answer times of stress or uncertainty, times of confusion or insecurity, when life hits us sideways and we lose a loved one or we lose a job or we receive bad news of any sort of fashion, it becomes even harder to answer the question, who am I? And so we run the risk of going through an identity crisis, this period of time where we question our sense of self or our place in this world. And it can cause us to get stuck, make bad choices, or even walk away from our faith. Who am I? 
And that's what we're going to explore today as we look at an incredible passage of Scripture out of 1 Peter. Last week, we started a new series in the book of 1 Peter. And as Pastor Chris explained, this book was written by one of Jesus' disciples, the Apostle Peter. And it was written to a group of believers who were under Roman occupation, under Roman rule. And the culture surrounding these believers was one in which their faith was scorned, their, their morality was questioned and criticized, and their hope was mocked. And Peter wrote to the, encourage these, these Christians to hold on to their faith in the midst of the trials and persecution and to hold on to their hope in Christ regardless of the situations they found themselves in. And as we saw last week, we too can have this resilient hope, this hope that is able to withstand or recover quickly in difficult circumstances. Why? Because we can have faith in the future that God has planned because God is in every detail. And we can walk in that hope with holiness and with a reverence towards God. And so this morning we're going to look at another aspect of that enables us to hold on to hope in times of trial. And we're going to find it in the first 10 verses of 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. Now, remember, Peter has just written things and said things like this. I am writing to God's chosen people. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. You have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. You love him even though you have never seen him. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious, gracious salvation that will come to you and live as God's obedient children. And then Peter picks up on those thoughts with these in chapter 2. Verse 1, he says, So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's Kindness. Basically, what Peter is saying here is now that you know God, now that you have received salvation from Him, you need to get rid of all the junk in your life. How? By being transformed by the Word of God. That's what Peter is referring to as the pure spiritual milk. It's only by ingesting the Word of God that we are able to grow in our faith and experience what, Paul, uh, what Peter calls the full experience of. Of salvation. That's the importance of being in the Word of God. Let's continue. First Peter chapter 2, verse 8, verse 4, sorry. It says, You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor. And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. For, but for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone, and he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. There are just a few key thoughts I want to pause on in this section. First, Peter reminds the people, and therefore us, that our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the chief cornerstone of God's temple. Now, what does that mean? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know much about uh, construction. What I did find out was that in ancient times, a cornerstone was the most important stone of the building. The total weight of the entire structure would sit on this one stone, and if this stone was removed, the entire structure would collapse. 
It, it was also really important for using because it was the stone by which all the other walls were kept straight. Careful measurements were taken to ensure that the cornerstone was square to ensure the proper alignment of the remainder of the building. And the builders would then take sightings along the edges of this one cornerstone. And if the cornerstone was set properly, then the stonemasons could be assured that all other corners of the building were set appropriate as well. And so the Bible states that Jesus is the cornerstone of God's temple. He is the one with the most strategic and foundational place in God's kingdom. And like the ancient cornerstone of the physical building, Jesus is the one who determines the position, structure, and uh, stability of the spiritual temple of God, his people, his church. And so he is the one we, as followers, must set our sights on to find the direction for our lives. Jesus is the sure, centered, stable, and strong foundation that we are able to build our lives on. What's more, he is a living cornerstone. He isn't dead. He is alive and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. He is personal. He is approachable. And he exists to be in relationship with you and in relationship with me. And according to this passage, as we interact with this cornerstone, there are only two responses. You can either recognize Jesus for who he is, trust in him, and know that you will never be disgraced, or you can reject him and become he becomes a stone that causes people to stumble. Peter goes on to write in verse 9. He says this, he says, but you are not like that. Meaning you are not the one who rejects Jesus. He says, but you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful life. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. There is such beautiful language in here, and there's such incredible metaphors um, that this is the section I want us to camp out on for the remainder of our time today. You see, these two verses help us to answer the question, who am I? And I believe when we truly understand what God is telling us in these verses with these images, that we are able to confidently answer the question, who am I? And by doing so, we can find all the confidence we need to face life's challenges with great power and stability, strength, and with great resilient hope. So according to this passage, who are we? Well, first in verse 9, it says that we are chosen people. Now, now remember, all of these things are in the context of having first said yes to to Jesus, of having received salvation and having submitted our lives to him, that we are given this identity. So the first thing that we are told is that we are chosen people. Now, I don't know about you, but I like being chosen. Like when we were in elementary school and we picked teams for kickball, like I like being picked one or two, you know, or three at the top, right? Okay. And to be honest, like at youth group, when we go to play uh, touch football or, or basketball, I actually still like being picked by the kids that they want me on their team. I don't know why, but they do. I like being liked. I like being wanted. I like knowing that somebody wants me. The first identity that Peter gives us in this passage is the identity of being chosen. How do we know that we're chosen by God? It actually starts back in the Old Testament. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is giving the sermon to the nation, and he says these words in Deuteronomy 7. He says, The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other nations, for you were the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. And he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with such a strong hand from your slavery and from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God 
who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. And then in the New Testament, Paul writes this, even before, even before he made the world, God loved us. And he chose us in Christ to be holy and without faults in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. We are chosen. We are selected. We are wanted even before we did anything to earn that. We never proved ourselves because we never could. But God still wanted us. He still desired this relationship with us. He still sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. Why? Because of his unfailing love. Because it is what he wanted to do. It is because it gave him great pleasure. God chose me. And if you are a follower of Christ, God chose you. And so when our brains and our hearts and our souls ask the question, who am I? Our first answer is this. I am chosen by God. Who are we? We are chosen by God. Peter goes on to write, you are royal priests. I actually want to circle back to verse 5 because I deliberately skipped over it um, earlier. Verse 5 says this, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Part of our new identity in Christ that Peter highlights is this picture of living stones. Much like Christ, the chief cornerstone, we too are being used by God to build his spiritual temple, his kingdom. And what's more, this new identity as priest is incredibly significant. You see, in biblical times, only the priest had direct access to God and only at specific times and in specific ways. And only the priest could offer sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. But when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, that system became unnecessary. No longer did people have to go to the temple and have the priest intercede on their behalf. No, Jesus became the mediator and gave people direct access to God the Father. This new identity of priests symbolizes the direct access that we have to God the Father through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, another significant application of this is to think about the role of a priest a role of the priest was twofold. First, it was to offer sacrifices for the people, and the second was to minister to them. And in biblical time, the role of the priest was to be this bridge, this gap filler between God and the people. And now we, because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, we get to be the bridge. And we don't ever need another titled priest to do that for us. We are each given the calling and the responsibility to help others find Jesus and to be that bridge builder and to minister to their needs. What Peter pointed, is pointing out is this. God is using us, his living stones, to build his spiritual temple. We are a dynamic part of what God is doing in the world, and we have a great responsibility. We are our holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. And as we see ourselves as priests, we understand who we are. So who are we? We are chosen by God. We are royal priests. We are a holy nation. Now, if you think about a nation, it has its own government, geography, culture, citizenship, all those type of things. And what Peter here refers, he refers to us as a holy nation. 
So what does that mean? Well, the Bible teaches that once we say yes to Jesus, once we put our faith and trust in him, that our citizenship is no longer here on planet Earth. Our citizenship changes. Philippians 3.20 says, But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And in Hebrews 13, 14, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And then Peter even alludes to this when he calls the recipients of this letter God's chosen people living as foreigners. And so since our citizenship is in heaven, unlike the nations of this world, we are called to act like that. We are called to be holy, to be set apart. This is what Pastor Chris pointed out last week in chapter 1. This reminder from Peter to be holy in everything you do, just as Jesus Christ, who chose you, is holy. Because we are governed by the King of kings and Lord of lords, we honor him, we obey him, and we are set apart for him. We are a holy nation. Who are we? We are a chosen by God. We are royal priests. We are a holy nation. And Peter writes these words. You are God's very own possession. Now, a possession is something that is highly valued property. It's something that someone uh, owns. It's something that belongs to someone. And the value of that possession is determined by how much someone is willing to pay for it. So how much Are you worth to God if you are his very own possession? In the last chapter, chapter 1, Peter wrote this, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. What's our value as God's possession? Well, Jesus paid for you with his very life. God exchanged his own son for you. The cross proves your value. God basically says, I value you so much that I am willing to send my son to the cross to die for your sins, to purchase for you freedom. That is how much I value you. That is how much you are worth as God's very own possession. We are chosen by God. We are royal priests. We are a holy nation. We are God's very own possession possession and we have a purpose verse 10 says as a result or actually the end of verse 9 as a result you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light I actually like the words used in the English standard version uh, translation of the Bible a little better it reads this way it says um, that as a result you so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That, my friends, is our purpose. God gave us these new identities of being chosen and royal and priestly and holy and valued when we came to faith in him. Why? Because we have work to do. We have an opportunity to proclaim the incredible works that God has done. This word proclaim here literally means to tell as many people as possible. And the excellencies that we are to proclaim are the attributes and character and power of God on display through his saving work in bringing us out of darkness. We were called out of darkness. The darkness of our sin, the darkness of our despair, the darkness of our unbelief. Once we were stumbling around in darkness, thinking we had our lives together, thinking we had purpose, thinking we knew what we were doing and why we were doing it. But the truth of the matter is, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have a clue. And so Christ rescued us from that. He called us out of that darkness into his marvelous light. And now we have a purpose and the privilege of taking that message to others who do not yet believe. We are chosen by God. 
We are royal priests. We are a holy nation. We are God's very own possession, and we have a purpose. And finally, we are forgiven and belong to God. In verse 10, Peter writes, Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. And this is a, just a really incredible way to end this study this morning. In this verse, we see this great exchange happening. And while I was studying this passage in preparation for this morning, I actually came across a really interesting story found in an obscure book of the Old Testament. There was this prophet by the name of Hosea. And God told Hosea to go marry a promiscuous woman. And this woman was unfaithful to Hosea while um, being married to him. And in chapter 1 of the book of Hosea, uh, Hosea's wife, Gomer, has a baby daughter. And God tells Hosea, name this child not loved. For I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them. And you're thinking, wait, whoa, that's not a cool name to give a little baby girl. Not loved? But hold on a, a minute, because it gets even more interesting. So then Gomer, after the baby is weaned, Gomer then has a little boy. And God tells Hosea to name the little boy, not my people. For Israel is not my people, and I am not their God. So we have this one baby, not loved, for I no longer will love my people. And then we have another baby, not my people, for I am not their God. But this is where it gets really cool. In chapter 2 of Hosea, God says, on that day, meaning on that day when his bride comes back to him, he says, I will show love to those I called not loved. And I will, I will uh, say to those people, not my people, I will say, now you are my people. And they will reply, you are our God. And this passage that Peter is referencing when he wrote, once you had no identity as people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, you have received God's mercy. This is the very same passage in Hosea. And the significance is huge for us. Once we lived in darkness, once we lived without the love of God, once we lived not loved, once we lived not as his people, but now, now we are a chosen people a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. We have a purpose. We have an identity as God's people, and we have received God's mercy. So the question becomes, what would it mean if we really understood this truth? I think it would mean that we would live lives of great freedom and joy and confidence and hope. But the problem is, is that society is full of lies about who we are. The stuff, the stuff that happened to us in the past is full of lies that whisper in our ear about who we are. Our own doubts, our fears, our insecurities tell us lies about who we are. But Christ wants to set us free from that. Christ wants us to live in the truth of who we are in him. We are chosen. We are accepted. We are valued. We are forgiven. Why? Because there is so much at stake. We have a calling to preach the gospel, to tell others what the difference God has made in our lives. And we are to help others to step out of the darkness and into the wonderful light of Jesus Christ. And it first starts by saying yes to Jesus. And so this morning, if you have never accepted what Jesus Christ did on the cross, if you've never believed in your heart of, of the fact that Jesus wants to forgive you, if you've never confessed your need for a Savior, then today could be the day that you step out of darkness and receive a new identity in Christ. For some of you, you may have been walking away from God lately. For whatever reason, number of reasons. And today may be the day that you go, you know what? I want to step back into who I am in Christ. And still for others of you, you may have been struggling recently. 
Maybe even today, maybe even you walked in the doors this morning plagued by doubts or insecurity or fear or worry or anxiety or any number of things. But you can walk out of here with a fresh understanding of the identity that is yours because of Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we close, uh, the band is actually going to play a song called, Oh, Come to the Altar. And what I want to do is um, I actually want to ask two or three, uh, no more than four of our prayer team people, um, if you could come, maybe two of you over here, two of you over here. And this morning, if you would like to talk to somebody or have somebody pray with you so that you can receive Christ as your Savior, then I'm going to ask you during this song to come forward. And they would love to pray with you. They would love to introduce you to Jesus and help you to make that decision to receive your new identity in Christ. Or maybe today, like I said, you walked in this morning and you're plagued with doubt or insecurity or fear or any of those things. And you just need to be reminded of who you are in Christ. And you would like for somebody to pray with you. Whatever it is, we invite you to come during this song. Oh, come to the altar. But for now, what I'm going to ask you to do is if everybody would just close your eyes, bow your head, close your eyes. I want to leave you with these words from 1 Peter. Let them soak deeply into your soul before you leave. And maybe think about these as we sing this next song. You are wanted. You are chosen. You have a calling. You are valuable. You were bought with a great price. You are accepted. You are priests, a holy nation. You are God's people. You are forgiven.